Hello everyone, welcome to myself, Max McGillifree from Beanstalk Global. It's an absolute pleasure to be presenting to you today about um, our broadcast series that we've set up with, I, I think, three inspirational uh, people, being Barbara, um, Barbara Bray, Mark Driscoll and Jackie Green. And this broadcast, um, we're going to be majoring on the, the topic of food trade standards, the implications for healthy and sustainable foods. And what a time we're having um, on this whole subject, just in our little green room, we were talking about the implications of the upcoming uh, US elections and how that's going to affect um, food trade standards as to which president uh, comes in. And you only have to look um, as to what has actually happened in the, in the last couple of weeks uh, within, within the UK, all around the likes of the agricultural bill. Um, I got um, contacted by a senior um, individual within one of the industry trade groups um, to publicise the fact that there's been in my words, this is my opinion, a debacle within the lights of uh, Red Tractor, where the uh, chairperson, uh, Baroness Neville Rolfe, um, has uh, uh, voted against the uh, the um, Ag Bill, um, but even though that she's she's the chair of um, of, uh, of of Red Tractor, um, and needless to say, she had to then step down um, as chair uh, person of of Red Tractor because her position would look to be um, uh, non 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 valid because she she can't how can she support red tractor and not support um a, a uk agriculture so there's such a debate and there's such a conversation to be to be had so let i think probably the easiest thing to do is let, let's get into this so let's let's get um if we could have um barbara bray mark driscoll and uh, jackie if you're there and we know that jackie's got slightly bad internet con connection so so you guys, as I said in the on the intro, you to me you're inspirational because you're looking to make a change, and, and we're grateful that you came to us, Beanstalk, so that we can use our platform to get your word and your and your your good news out. And we're just going to come to you in a minute and find out more about why you set up the group and what you want to achieve from the group. But just before we do that, I just want to highlight to everyone who's um, uh, dialed in the um, amazing other speakers that we've got. So can I also call in um, Professor Michael uh, Cardwell? Um, uh, who's the Professor of um, Agricultural Law for Leeds University. And can we also have uh, in Mike Hansen, who's the Sustainability Director for Baxter Story. And can, not last but not least, can we have Barbara Crowtherin, uh, who's the Campaign Coordinator for the Children's Food Campaign Sustain. So let's just start with um, with our speakers, um, because I just want to get everyone excited about um, about hearing from them. So, so let, let's start with yourself, uh, Professor. Professor, can you just give us a short intro on yourself, please, so that um, everyone is fully aware, aware of who you are, please? Over to you, Professor. Many thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm, my name is Michael Cardwell. I work in the law school at the University of Leeds, uh, originally from a farming background up in up in Yorkshire. Uh, be, worked in legal practice for six years before moving across to academia. And since then, I've been increasingly working in looking how agriculture operates as the first chain, first link in the food chain. And it's become increasingly clear that our food standards go right back to uh, the beginning of production. And also that we're operating within pretty strict rules at world trade level. Uh, and on that regard, I have the privilege of working with Fiona Smith uh, at Leeds, who's a, a major expert in this area. If I get any questions, I don't know the answer to. I'll uh, phone her as phone a friend. Thank you. <laughs> Pro Professor, well, well done. Mike, Mike Hansen, a little bit of an introduction from yourself, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Um, great to be here. Um, Mike Hansen, I'm Director of Sustainability for Baxter Story. Baxter Story, we are a... Um, a uh, food service company for business and industry and universities, um, providing catering in the workplace, so for the likes of Goldman Sachs and PwC and Nationwide, uh, amongst many others. Um, so I look after sustainability. I've been with the company a long time, uh, but I'm a caterer by trade. I'm a caterer originally, so many, many years as a chef, so I've got a real uh, experience in food service and catering, uh, moved into the sustainability field in uh, 2006, Uh, so really have a, have a, have a, a dual um, viewpoint. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Fantastic. Mike, thank you. Barbara, Barbara Crowther, a little bit of introduction from yourself, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Barbara Crowther. I work for the Food and Farming Alliance Sustain. So that's over 100 organisations working on a range of issues around sustainable food, 
farming and fishing. Uh, my role there is the coordinator of the children's food campaign, and that is all about access to healthy, affordable and sustainable food for all children. So most recently, we've been very heavily involved in the wow. preschool meal discussions. Um, my, my career on trade goes back a long way. I was personally at the Battle of Seattle at the World Trade Organization back in 1999, um, when everything kind of blew up. Um, and I was also for 13 years, the Policy and Public Affairs Director for the Fair Trade Foundation. So very passionate wow. as well about access to markets on fair and sustainable terms for some of the poorest uh, producers of the developing world. But right now at Sustain, we're really focused on how do we make sure that in future trade negotiations, we uphold uh, high environmental animal welfare uh, and uh, public health. Um, and we, we deliver our trade deals in line with our policies to support our food and farming sector and also um, our ambitions to halve child obesity by 2030. Wow. Barbara, thank you. So to everyone dialing in, whether you're uh, watching on Facebook uh, live or um, on Zoom, we've got these powerhouses of experts within the sector. So um, the way that we're gonna structure this is that, so we're gonna just have a catch up with the founders of the um, Healthy and Sustainable Food Group. Um, and then I'm gonna have a, an, an individual word with um, uh, Professor Cardwell, with Mike um, and with Barbara. And then we're gonna have um, about uh, 20, 30 minutes of Q&A. So get your questions ready. If you look at, you, you know, all know how Zoom works. If you look at the bottom bar, you can put your questions in now, ready for us to then um, ask all of the experts a little bit later. So if I could ask, um, Professor Cardwell, Mike and um, Barbara Crowley, if you could just step back and turn off your uh, video um, and your audio. Um, and then let, let's come over to um, Barbara and Mark and, um, and Jackie. Jackie, Mark, uh, what, was the, what was the thought behind setting up um, the, the Healthy and Sustainable uh, Food Group? You're, you're all very bu busy people. It's not as if you, you don't need more, more to do. Uh, what, what's, what's the raison d'etre? Mark, let's start with yourself. So I think the, the real aim here, Max, was uh, really an opportunity um, to um, pull together different actors across the food system, but also outside the food system. We know um, collaboration is going to be absolutely key to addressing some of those uh, environmental, social, economic challenges within the 21st century that we confront as a result um, of our food system, which is not fit for purpose. So whether that's climate heating, biodiversity loss, obesity, malnutrition, hunger, food security, our food, the way we grow, process, distribute and consume food is at the heart of those challenges. Uh, and this group is really uh, uh, an opportunity to get together different actors from growers, processors, retailers, food service, civil society, actually the health sector investors to, to really talk about um, and explore some of those challenges, but more importantly, explore opportunities for collaborations and for solutions to address those challenges. And I love, I love this word collaboration. There's, you could be powerful as one, but uh, you could be immensely powerful as a, as a group. J Jackie, you look at your 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 background. Um, I, I've, got to, I've got to use the big word. I've got your illustrious background within food with the likes of um, Bacavore and being the CEO of a, of a major powerhouse fresh produce business. Do you, what, what's your driver? What, what's your passion for, for setting up a group such as this? I think just to echo what um, Mark has said, we see, and I've certainly seen in my background, that collaboration can really genuinely uh, make amazing things happen but I suppose as we sit um, with the first paper of our national food strategy having been published and uh, pandemic aside a number of crises uh, globally as well as in our country um, we've all sat on panels and uh, steering groups that have been fairly mono industry and what's clear is that these actors that Mark describes need to come together to recognise the role they have to play, but also there are best practice in industries that typically would never sit at a table with fresh produce, fresh food, farming. Um, and, and we've got so much we should be sharing with each other. So for me, having caught up with Barbara as a former colleague and me, Mark, we just sort of sat down and said, come on, what, what can we do about this? And let's 
um, try and get the right actors around the table to, to really, I suppose, start a discussion, but actually um, generate a call to arms and facilitate that collaboration, um, put parties together that don't necessarily know each other yet. Barbara, anything else to add? I really want to focus on that call to action because what we are trying to do is, is get people who may be sitting on the fence or don't necessarily know the next best step, but you can link them up with people who can provide a solution or who have the other half to their problem. You know, if it's getting better distribution or getting better awareness of a product or connecting them to retail or food, whatever it is, by having everybody come to our page and share their, their stories and we've got our, our massive networks that we can plug people into. We can just do that. And I think it's great that even from last month's session where we were talking about food security and some of the problems of getting fresh produce out to people, already I can see the ripple effect of relationships of people of saying, well, I've seen what, um, what Dr. Megan Blake had to say. I really mm -hmm. want to harness that in my local area. Or I've seen what Tom had to say about his efforts with the watercress and trying to get that out and seeing what they can do within their own businesses. So sometimes it's just the awareness that helps trigger an idea in somebody else's head. They think, oh, I can do that too. And it facilitates that change. And I want to be part of that system doing that and having great people around me like Jackie and Mark, who, who've got fabulous address books as well. So we can, we can really add some benefit to the industry. Well, well done. Um, uh, Jackie, Barbara, uh, Mark, just stay there. Professor Cardwell, can you come back in? Because I've just got a, a question to ask of you of this group. So, Professor, if you could come back in. So, so Professor, you you have sat in, I'm sure, a number of meetings and groups, and some of them would have been very, very beneficial and some of them uh, perhaps not so much. How do you think this group that Barbara, Jackie and Mark have set up for healthy and sustainable foods, how can they make a success of, of this um, with, with all your past experiences of seeing groups come and, come and go and, and discussions and, and talks? And inter how can they make a success of this group, Professor, do you think? I think it's a, it's a combination of their, their experience. All, all three have got, have got very significant experience in the sector. And, and, and also, I think that the fact that their connections and their ability to, as they said, to build alliances. What does seem to be the case is that movement outside outside government, outside the parliamentary process does seem to be able to gain traction. We're just perhaps moving to food standards. You might be able to, to uh, uh, well, you all I'm sure have noticed the extent to which uh, things like the witch survey and yes, also yes. the effect on supermarkets of uh, chlorine chicken, etc. Public pressure, mobilization of food movements uh, has led to, it seems most supermarkets been going to be reluctant to stock uh, hormone beef or uh, chlorine chicken. So I think the groups operating out, start formally outside government and outside the parliamentary process will be able to gain traction. So I, I, I wish them well. Fa fantastic. Th thank you, Professor, for, the, for that advice. So, Professor, let's have a conversation with yourself. Mark, Barbara, uh, Jackie, if you could um, uh, turn your video off and we'll, we'll bring you back, uh, back in a, a little bit later. Um, so, so, Professor, you, you do you have an, a, a luscious background, but rather, rather than um, talking about the past, let, let's talk about, about the, the future. So where, where, do you, you, where do you think we are in the respect of the, the trade support um, sector? Do you think the trade bill going through Parliament at, at the moment supports or undermines the, the, these trading standards? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think the bill as originally put forward, uh, the agriculture bill, uh, as, as I think is well known, did not have any uh, formal provisions regarding trade standards. And they also, um, th there was talk whether it should be in the trade bill, whether it should be the agriculture bill. I think there's a, that's the first thing, there's a danger of not having joined up government. So trade and agriculture run so closely together. I think the major problem is the, the, this concern, which has been expressed by the Lords and is now, I think, used the legal expression in ping pong between the House of Lords and the House of Commons, is whether you can set up a system where domestic producers have been held to one standard, but imports potentially are coming in at a lower standard. I think to myself, there's, there seem to be two, two main issues come from that. The first one is it, it, it wouldn't be much fun being a farmer if you're competing with people who are able to produce to lower standards. But I think right below all of it is even, perhaps even bigger question is what we want is good, nutritious food on the table, 
And what we don't want to be doing is sort of having some sort of financial trade off. So it's OK to have not so good food, but, but cheaper. I think everyone's entitled to good, nutritious food. So I think we want to put something in place which will guarantee safe, nutritious food for everyone, whether domestic or, or imported. And I'm not not clear that the bill um, as presently drawn will 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 cover that. So to predict the future. We, we are here in five years time. What do you think will have happened with the with the likes of the bill? I I think, funnily enough, it, going back to what I said earlier, I think an awful lot, if we're looking into the future, seems to be coming from consumer power. Um, there does seem to be, uh, for example, sensitivity on the part of supermarkets as to uh, their customers, what their customer preferences are. If you look, actually, this is going back one, think of GM. Um, GM is authorised for various GM products, but they're not on supermarket shelves at the moment because consumers, uh, 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 it isn't top of their priorities and supermarkets may take a hit uh, financially and reputationally if they stop them. So I think consumer power and particularly the work of people like which is, is, is a, real, a real positive. But I do think a lot, which as you said right at the beginning, with, will be the international trade landscape, whether we have uh, the administration in the States is going to be important. And personally, if I sort of we talked about a call to arms, one thing I would really like to see is major reforms to the World Trade Organization because wow. its rules were set up, came to force in 1995, long before a lot of these were major issues, long before climate change was an issue. And if we could, this is more hope than expectation, have an agreement which takes account of consumer preferences the way livestock's reared, the, in, uh, the climate change, which wasn't even a major issue in yeah. 1995. So I think that's one thing I'd love to see changed. Fingers crossed. Professor, thank you. Um, and Professor, just, just stay, stay there. Um, Mike, can, can you come on in, please? Hi. And, and so, to Mike, um, just out, out of curiosity, with the likes of uh, Baxter Story, which is a, a hugely um, ethically well-run professional uh, business, do you have much inter interaction with the with the likes of um, P Professor Cardwell, or, or are you fairly siloed in, in your thinking as a as a, as a food service business? Uh, uh, great question. I mean, our, certainly our uh, our key relationships are. Um, are actually with uh, the tend to be with our suppliers between our suppliers and our and our, and our customers. Um, we do as a as a, our own business. We have a decentralized supply chain, so we tend to have slightly more direct relationships with farmers and growers. Um, I was I was very fortunate to be up on uh, Beeswax Dyson Farm um, up in Lincoln last week. Um, fantastic operation, seeing the beta harvest and everything. It was amazing, and it's great to be able to have that connection. Um, our connection with with uh, the academic world, uh, shall we say, is probably through uh, through journals, um, through events such as this, um, reading literature, really. So we're relative. We're, we're quite sort of um, uh, separate from the actual production itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mike, it wasn't meant to be a trick question. I just think with the this sort of platform that the, the, the guys have created, there's so much uh, collaboration that could be had with the li likes of the professor and his ilk and uh, and, and yourselves. Um, professor, thank you very much. If you could just um, step away and turn off your um, audio and your uh, and your your sound, your, your video, that'd be fa fantastic. So, so, Mike, when we had our um, catch up every, every, with everyone, where we were just doing the warm up for, for this broadcast, yeah. um, I was I was fascinated ab ab about Baxter's story as to how, in some ways, fundamentally different you are as a business. C can you just describe um, a, a little bit in more detail about the likes of the sourcing that you do and why you cherish the relationship you have with your supplier partners? Yeah, yeah, sure. We um, so right from our inception, um, we started a, or we, we operate to a, a decentralized supply chain, um, and that is fundamentally different to some of the larger organisations. Um, whereas we will actually work with um, smaller local providers. Uh, we have somewhere in the region of three thousand suppliers across the whole wow. of the company, um, all regional uh, distribution. Uh, regional um, uh, farmers, growers, producers. Uh, and what that does is it gives the chefs and the managers the opportunity to, one, create their own menus, their own recipes, uh, but buy pretty much what they want from where they want, as long as it's uh, within the parameters of 
clearly of health and safety and so on, um, they get the opportunity to buy amazing fresh local ingredients that have not traveled very far with a short supply chain, um, delivering amazing product. But, but because they're able to do that, it's using their own recipes, um, me- means they're really passionate, excited about what they've done. That's brilliant. Therefore, they do the product. And, 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 and does, does, does it work? I've, I've always been taught that uh, we're in business for two reasons, to have fun and to make money. Um, I'm guessing that there yeah. might be some com- um, competitors out there who all they're looking at is not having fun and just making money and trying to steal, yeah. um, steal yeah. business, business away from you. Is, is, is it a loss leader or, or does that model work? And, and if the model works for you, surely everyone should be copying the, the great work that you all do. Well, I, I, it's, a, that's a, it's an interesting question. I think um, one of the key things around our business, we are absolutely driven by the top line rather than the bottom line. So it's all wow. about sales and you drive sales by having by delivering amazing quality fresh food served by incredibly well-trained people um and that delivers um the 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 revenue and as long as you've got your your basically sums correct then you'll drive your bottom line uh and it stands the reason so rather than just trying to sort of uh, race to the bottom and cut costs that will obviously at some point impact your your top line so we're all, we're all about delivering an amazing service, which will, as long as we've got all our sums right, we'll deliver the bottom line. And, and is the consumer aware of the, the fantastic work that, that you do, or is it slightly departed because you're, you're selling into um, a, a, another third party who's then selling to the consumer? Can the consumer find out about you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we absolutely share our story uh, with, with, our, with our customers. Um, I think you could, we, could probably, we could always share more. Um, and I think we've always been um, slightly uh, um, one of the thing, one of the areas where we haven't been quite so good is probably um, talking the walk. We walk the walk, but we don't necessarily talk it that well uh, in some situations. So we could always improve, um, but we absolutely deliver, uh, share our messaging with our customers, tell them how far the foods travel, how it's made, sharing recipe cards, um, talking to them about the environmental impact of foods. So we've done. A huge work work on, for example, um, supporting veganery. We have a food EQ uh, project, which is around plant based, um, healthy, nutritious food. Um, so, absolutely, it's a, it's a collaborative thing, and our customers really, really enjoy it. Really, you know, really um, buy into our model. And it was a, it was a slightly cheeky question because I've done quite a bit of research on your business since our, our last chat, and I would um, ask everyone to have a, a look at Mike's uh, website and see more about the story of um, of, of ba- Baxter Story. And, and and Mike Baxter Story, how how many other businesses in your sector have a sub- sustainability director, or are you are you a lone voice within your business within your sector? Uh, I don't think I'm a lone voice. I was po- possibly. Um, we were po- possibly one of one of the first businesses to have somebody um, purely in a sustainability role. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but certainly pretty much everybody now has got a, some sort of uh, sustainability, Brilliant. environmental CSR lead um, because everybody appreciates how important it is, yeah. particularly at the moment. Post, yep. you know, as we hopefully we we start to emerge from uh, from COVID. Yeah, well said, Mike. Stay there, Barbara. Bar- Barbara Crather, can you come in, please? So, so I'm just going to ask a similar question as, uh, as, as asked Professor Cardwell to Mike. Uh, Barbara, do you have much interaction with the, 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 with the likes of a, of a Baxter story or, or similar businesses? Uh, yeah, we do. We, we have a lot of interaction with the catering sector uh, at Sustain. Uh, so through the children's food campaign, obviously, we've got a lot of suppliers into uh, the school meals sector, into the hospital food sector. Um, we One of our members is the Soil Association and their Soil Association wow. Food for Life program um, is, is very involved um, with the likes of Caterlink, which is a member, which is the catering arm of, of Baxter Story. Um, and Caterlink has been one of the leading lights actually in sugar reduction um, in the in school meals. So um, we do we do work very, very well and often with the catering sector. 
Fantastic. I was, I was slightly winging it as normal. I was trying to make this connection with uh, Professor Cardwell, with Mike and yourself to get this, uh, this, this, this chain of com conversation going. But if, if, you, if you're already done doing it, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, Mike, if you could just um, uh, turn off your um, audio and your microphone yeah. and uh, we'll just catch up with, uh, with Barbara. And everyone, remember, we've got this powerhouse of, of experts here. So keep firing your questions in for the Q&A um, a little bit later. So, so Bar Barbara, everything is um, is rosy in the garden, isn't it? We, we've got no big issues about child poverty, food poverty. Uh, we don't need to have any footballers coming in to, um, I, I'm just on a petition, uh, to, to influence. The, what, what is, what's your snapshot view as to where we are in this chaotic period of COVID, of politics, of uh, American elections? You, you must be right in the eye of the storm. Uh, have, uh, what, what, what's your view? What's your take? Yeah, it's, it, it feels at times like we've got a real perfect storm of issues going on. Um, so obviously the COVID pandemic has really shone a light on quite how broken um, our food system can be in terms of supply, supply and demand, and in particular um, getting food to those who are vulnerable and food insecure and the cracks in the system. Um, obviously with Brexit and what one of the challenges we have is very clear that um, under a no deal Brexit, um, we increasingly, if that if that led to food shortages or pr food price spikes, um, that would disproportionately hit on those who are already food insecure. And so the combination of Brexit and increasingly starting to look like uh, a deal with the EU is going to be hard to come by. Um, rising concern about how that may add to the food insecurity that COVID has already created and in the midst of that we've got these huge community campaigns and, and suddenly a recognition um, and a huge support uh, of solidarity for standing by poor children during half term week right now yeah. um, but under trade negotiations we do have uh, a number of threats uh, to our high food standards and a very interestingly research has shown that actually poor and vulnerable vulnerable and poor people low-income people are just as passionate about high food wealth, animal welfare, environmental yeah. standards, farmers being paid properly um, as people in middle income. Because if you are on a limited budget, you can't buy your way out of those problems. You can't you yeah. can't gravitate to the higher cost items. So therefore, you know, it's all the more important that those standards remain enshrined in law. And yeah. that's why we've been trying really hard to get uh, with along with the NFU a million uh, signatures on their petition, Jamie Oliver, and a huge network of people coming out in support saying, we must put this in law because the whole nation wants it. Um, and so that's why it's really important, the vote that's going on next week in Parliament. I, I love some of the comments that have been coming through. Who, who was the uh, Conservative MP advising um, families that they could go to M&S and get uh, three meals for, for seven pounds. And uh, I, I can't remember the, the other chap who, who then did the, the recipe instructions on how a family can make um, uh, make an omelette. Um, and as, as someone far more um, uh, uh, articulate than, than me pointed out, that, that the issue is rent um, and council tax and not having a job and, and so on and so forth. Barbara, the, the, the clap for the NHS campaign over the, the first lockdown was, was, was fascinating. Um, do you think that the likes of the, the Marcus Rashford ca campaign, is, is that just a distraction for actually what you are trying to do? Or is it, is it actually assisting? I, I think it's assisting hugely. Um, so on the free school meal debate, we had been uh, campaigning for months around the potential wow. risk to children over summer. And so it felt like we'd been passing the ball around the midfield <laughs> and backwards and forwards and back to the goalie and back up the field. Um, and in the end, we managed to get, get the ball crossed to Marcus Rashford and he got it in the net for us. Um, wow. So I think it's hugely helpful. Um, I think the issue of trade, which we're, we're discussing today, is, is much harder to grasp. For a lot of people in the threat of trade. So if you take, for example, our traffic light system, uh, of, of, of showing on, on pack uh, what is healthy and what is less healthy, uh, then we know that the US has openly challenged other countries around their nutritional labelling uh, as part of trade negotiations. And so unless we have protection of public health and impacts assessments on public health as part of our trade deals and our trade negotiations, alongside all of those other issues that have become very well aired, chlorinated chicken, 
hormone fed beef racked up in uh, pork you know all of these issues the amounts of antibiotics being used uh, in agriculture in 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 food in um animal welfare all of these issues and um, unless we have these things enshrined as being things we want to protect um they become open for negotiation and we know that um the US in particular but not just the US mm-hmm. is quite aggressively pursuing yeah. um deals that will and that will kind of bring our standards down to their level so that they can then get their products into our into yeah. our markets so, so in this chaotic time i, I asked uh, professor cardwell predict the future where are we going to be in five years time barbara where do you where do you want this to be in five years time realistically where do you think it will be where where do you want it to be I think we we do have an opportunity uh, to rethink um, our food and farming support systems and obviously the the environmental land management system that's currently also um, being developed. Um, So I think we do have an opportunity to take back control of some of these things and to say, actually, we have this target of halving childhood obesity. That means we do want to be best in class uh, around the kinds of nutritional labels that we have on on pack. We've seen how the soft drinks industry levy um, has uh, taken 44% of sugar out of soft drinks uh, in the last three to four years. So we want to be able to continue to have that policy space um, to be able to really start to make progress. And we've seen, you know, the, the, the shock of COVID has reawakened government interest in tackling obesity. Uh, as well and we need to make trade part of that so I think if we can grasp the opportunity to be brave in terms of a uh, you know climate smart agriculture here in the UK high British standards and winning trade deals on the back of just how great our produce is how great our products are how healthy they are that is an investment in long-term food sustainability food security Uh, and so I you know we should be aspiring to be to be that nation um uh, <laughs> whether we'll make it <laughs> well we we've got to kind of lean on our politicians a lot over the next few months and and, and not not to uh, go go back on it but marcus rashford was was a real positive bulldozer really disruptive that created such a change very quickly are there any blockers to, for what you want to see happen in the, in the next three, three to five years, if there was a, another Marcus Rashford type individual or group or, or scenario, what, what are the main blockers that you see out there? I think the economic crisis that we're going to be in um, and where the money comes from in the midst of, of food insecurity. So, you know, certainly looking at how do we um, create a green economic recovery? So how do we reinvent um, new roles in food and farming become a bit more um, self-sufficient um, and, and really put some investment behind a green economic recovery, a sustainable economic recovery, um, decent work. And, you know, if we go to the heart of what's going on with the free school meal agenda, the issue is not food poverty, it's poverty. Yeah. Um, and so actually, how do we create decent jobs in sustainability um, and sustainable agriculture, food, farming, fishing. And, you know, we're an island nation. We ought to have the most sustainable fisheries around our coastlines because that's going to be good for us and good for our trade in future. Yeah. Barbara, Barbara, well done. Fantastic. Stay there. Everyone else, can you can you come uh, back in? Um, so this 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 points of where we are at the, the where we are in this chaotic nature of everything it's, uh, I'm desperately trying not to use the phrase that uh, we used on a, on a previous bro- uh, um, broadcast of an amazing lady from South Af- Africa uh, used the expression, never waste a crisis. And someone else used that within, I think, British politics or, and, and they got lambasted for it. But surely there's a, there's a level of change here that can be accelerated because of the situation that we're in. I got very frustrated, um, every, everyone, at the, the back end of the, the first lockdown. There was, a, there was a letter that came out signed by 100 industry leaders uh, within uh, oil companies and banks to the government. And it was an open letter, I think it was published in the Times, stating that uh, now is the time to uh, make a change. And as we work all through this, uh, we should be looking to a better, greener, more environmental future. And the letter was a, a great, very eloquent, but there's no 
conversation in that letter, no um, referencing to food, fresh food, or l l looking to eliminate um, uh, food, food poverty. Um, Mark, let, let's start with yourself. Do you, with, with trading standards, with the, what we're learning from Professor Cardwell, from Barbara, from, from Mike, do, do you think there is a positivity to be had as we work through this crisis and there is, a, there, there is a positivity? Do you think there will be a bright light at the end of the tunnel, Mark? Yeah, and I, th I think consensus can be found, you know, as Barbara and everyone has said, the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle to me is around government uh, leadership. We have an ideal opportunity. Henry Dimbleby has already produced, uh, published part one of the national food strategy. We have part two coming out next year, more, mo mostly focused on sustainability, but has already made a number of recommendations uh, to address um, uh, kind of uh, affordability of food, uh, food poverty. We're seeing unprecedented <laughs> collaboration Certainly in my 20 years working more with civil society organisations, I've never actually seen uh, so much um, collaboration between, for example, the farming unions, environmental groups and animal mm. welfare organisations as we are getting over the um, agricultural bill and trade mm. bills uh, at, at the moment. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to drive that um, collaboration across business, civil society, uh, farming unions, really to push government to put keep the pressure on uh, and really ensure that um, food trade really delivers the, the kind of healthy, nutritious, sustainable foods. You know, we import 45% of our food uh, from uh, abroad and, and we absolutely need to look at not just trade, but more integrated government policies, government policies that assess health and sustainability across the piece and the national food strategy and this unprecedented collaboration, I think, is a unique opportunity. Yeah, agreed. T totally unique. Uh, Barbara, just coming to you, you, you very kindly posted up a, um, a, a very valid point about uh, what uh, Professor Cardwell um, stated earlier. Do, do, do you want um, about um, uh, the uh, asking everyone to contact the local MP? Do you want, do you want to just highlight that, uh, Barbara, Barbara Bray? Actually, yes, it was uh, Barbara Crowther who posted it, but oh, I'm God. quite happy to. <laughs> Go on. You, you, cover, you cover for Barbara, Barbara Bray. <laughs> so, yes, I think. Now that we are in this situation where bills go backwards and forwards, we, we still have an opportunity to influence this. And we, we know that we've had a series of U-turns over the summer. So we still have an option to be able to speak to our MPs, sign petitions, and just make sure that we do get our standards protected in law. I think that the window of opportunity is shrinking. I don't know whether Michael Cardwell can add a bit more to it, because when we start going into trade deals, if we haven't protected those standards. The, the flexibility that we've got then when we are a, a world trade deal situation or when we're look, doing deals under those rules, it gives us very little wriggle room to protect what we know is going to keep our population safer and healthier. We're not saying that we're going to be buying poisoned food or anything that's, that's drastic, but we've, we've reached a certain standard that we've got to and we want to maintain those standards going forward. So our call to action is for people to contact their MPs and say that we want these standards enshrined in law so we don't have a, a slippery slope and a race to the bottom where we just focus on cheap food. Barbara, thank you. And uh, th th this is what happens when you're not wearing your glasses. You, you get to, your, your Barbara's mixed up. Um, Professor Cardwell, um, a quick question. With, with this oddity that I talked about um, at, at the start of the broadcast, where we had the uh, chairperson of um, uh, Red Tractor um, voting against the bill, then um, having to step aside from, from Red Tractor. Do, do you think there's actually much point in contacting local MPs? Will they be influenced by the general populace, um, do you think, Professor Cardwell? I'm, I'm an eternal optimist on, on, on these matters in that I think the, the, um, the MPs at the end of the day represent their constituents. And it, it, this does seem to be an area where there's, I wouldn't go so far as saying consensus, but the, the high level of support for, for food standards. Like Barbara Cowther mentioned, the, uh, the WITCH uh, survey that came out that found it's across all sectors. It's, it's not confined to particular groups, doesn't depend on your wealth. I think uh, there's a general expectation across the board that, that we should have safe, nutritious food. And the, there are MPs already. For example, it was the um, 
in the, the Conservative chair of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee uh, was one of the first people sort of pushing for, for protection of food standards in, 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 uh, in trade bills. So, as I say, I don't think it's necessarily that party political. So with luck, I think keep writing and grab the, grab the opportunity. Um, as regards sort of windows, because at the moment it is still in play between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. But as you know, under the Parliament Act, the House of Lords will only be able to block for so long. So crack on while well, there's still a window, if that may. I think I've mixed a metaphor, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, uh, th th thank you. Thank you, Professor. So we had a really good, interesting point in from um, Douglas Allen, Dougie Allen. Uh, linked to food poverty, elephant in the room is food wastage at source, at the producer. What has been done by buyers and suppliers to help farmers drive um, be drive wastage down to make the most of getting whole harvest nutrition to hungry mouse? And you'd also, um, Dougie, if you don't know the stats, um, Barbara Crowther might be able to, to help me. It's something like a million bananas are thrown away by the consumer every day. So there's a high level of um, wastage potentially at the uh, producer end as well as with the consumer. Uh, Mike, Mike Hanson, what, what's your view of this? How, with, 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 your, with your headline title as a sustainability director for, for Baxter Story, you must be doing a lot of work on, on this element of, of wastage, both at the supplier end and the consumer end? Yeah, uh, we, uh, we do a, a, a lot on food wastage uh, management within Baxter Story. So we were founding signatories of the food, hospitality and food service agreement with RAP in 2012. And then from that developed our own program called Food Waste Cost in the Earth. So we now um, segregate into plate waste, spoilage waste and production waste, um, food waste in every single location. Um, so uh, since 2014, we launched that and we've saved around 40% 40 of food waste um, over that time, which is absolutely enormous. And it's fantastic that now every single location measures their food waste weekly and reports it online. On our own accounts platform. Um, in terms of food waste, from a, and that, uh, we do a lot of educating the customer as well. So obviously, and that's not just around portion control. But portion control is part of it in terms of not giving somebody too much, um, because but making sure that people understand the impacts of food waste. Training our own teams to make sure they understand the impacts of food waste, and then working. We've actually done work in the past with RAP, also going back to the supply chain. So. Uh, delivering information to um, our fruit and veg suppliers, uh, meat and dairy suppliers on how to reduce waste in their in their supply chain. Um, clearly, it's one of those things that they a lot of them will be doing that anyway because yeah. it's money and money is king uh, in this scenario. Um, but also things like making sure that we are um, not demanding perfect fruit and veg. No, we're not demanding, you know. If you're, if we're, if we, we, we use fresh fruit and veg, we use fresh products, as I've said earlier. So actually, we're gonna some of them, some of the product we're gonna actually gonna be peeling or roasting or whatever anyway. So actually, what's the harm if it's not perfectly straight? And sometimes it's um, it, it's it's making sure that we are sourcing um, the archetypal wonky asparagus, for example. Uh, and we we did that we did that last year. We actually bought we bought uh, we committed to a farm was. Um, in Kent, we, we bought all of their asparagus um, that wasn't fit for supermarkets. But interestingly, just one more point on this, and that this is um, something that I've always thought is when people would suggest that, you know, they would be quite happy to buy uh, wonky fruit and veg in the supermarket. But actually, then when you actually go into a supermarket and you see the piles of fruit and veg, and then you'll actually see people going through the piles, looking and turning over, looking for the blemishes, and then putting back the ones they don't want. So there's a real value action gap here, actually in terms of what people say they'll do and what they actually do. And the consumer is king. And the whole conversation we've had today is all about the power of the consumer, the power of the customer. They demand certain things, then the, then the market will change. But what they say is one thing and what they actually do is another, and real conflict. Yeah. And Jackie, with your previous background of running a major fresh produce business, do, do you think growers care about wastage, whether it be with themselves or, or with, whether it uh, be at the consumer end? Passionately, um, businesses and, and growers in particular do not have margins that permit them the ability to have high wastage but certainly uh, my most recent uh, role in, in berries um, 
waste really is a byproduct yeah. and growers can't afford to have uh, wonky produce um, and, and would work and work actively to work with varieties and growing techniques and husbandry techniques to eliminate waste before it even got, got to that point. But certainly retailers were hugely supportive of manufacturing. Um, that there's really good, I think, a really good collaborative spirit around food waste, in particular in fresh produce. Um, so, so I do actually feel in, within the industry, the collaboration is really good. But I, I agree, uh, you know, entirely. Actually, the consumer doesn't really know what it means. Wonky is quite uh, misleading in certain um, produce uh, areas in, in terms of what it is you should expect both cosmetically, but also from, a, from an eating um, point of view. And I had said to you, Max, I would have a straight banana and a wonky banana, and I haven't manifested it. But I think it's really important to recognize what we're talking about here. And, and, you know, we've talked about health and, you know, health in this context is around the health of the planet and sustainability is around the sustainability of such a broad, broad topic. It isn't just around what's being put in the bin or chopped up to be used in another process. You know, waste is as much about wasted resources and wasted energy um, and expenditure. So waste is a, a Jackie, thank you. Got it. Barbara, Barbara, Barbara Crowther, just on the, the food trade standards elements and, the, and our title, the implications for healthy and sustainable foods, there does seem to be this big disconnect between the consumer, the supply chain um, and, and the, the government. Uh, Barbara, it's a bit of a direct question, but have you ever heard of the, the Dutch diamond food supply chain model in, in Holland? Personally, no. I, I suspect my, my erudite colleagues are probably very familiar with it, but not, not personally. I, I've, I've already picked up on it recently that there's a, a great collaboration within Holland with government, with consumer and um, with the growers. So they call it the, 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 the Dutch diamond, that they all talk to each other. How, how can it, there's so much time and energy spent on this fractious conversation and everyone's pulling in different directions? Um, the, the, the Dutch have, have created a solution. How can we create, create a solution to, to, to get successful food trade standards to stop the, the wastage? So we, we're, we're feeding, feeding the kids so we don't have food poverty. When we've got a country just across the, across the channel who are already doing it, how, how can we do that? Um, I, yeah, it's hard. I, I suspect there's no, no silver bullet <laughs> to coin a, a cliche um, on these things. And I think... We, we have to look at the kind of the, the very way that the kind of the whole shopping experience. So I, I, there's a question um, uh, that was posted earlier as well about how do you get, you know, a, a hard pressed mother to pick up the apple in the supermarket rather than all of the, the unhealthy snacks for their children or to understand actually the apple represents a lot more value, nutritional value than all of these now packaged dried processed snacking yeah. apple <laughs> you know fruits that um that have become increasingly prevalent and and so that kind of starting with that promotional experience and where does value in the supply chain go um i think is really really important how do we get this into our trade standards well we have to have it enshrined in our trading objectives i mean at the moment public health has been named i think in 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 um response to the huge furore over chlorinated chicken um food that healthy food has been cited uh, or the safety of the food has been cited in our trading deal with the us but it's not at the moment in the negotiating mandate of any of the other deals that we're aware of mm. um and and it's a very narrow health and safety focus rather than you know putting this very clearly in the context of what do we do to tackle poverty what do we do to have a vibrant, sustainable food and farming sector from the retailers to the wholesalers, the caterers, the farmers, the growers, the, the food manufacturers? How do we make it sustainable um, and how do we and how do we um, have health at the heart of this? Yeah. And so when we're doing trade deals, there are impact assessments that are conducted, but they tend to be impact assessments with a very narrow focus on what might they do to trade within the industry rather than if we, you know, if if we end up having to sacrifice our soft drinks industry, what will happen to our obesity targets? And so um, I think I think we do have to have that enshrined in in the very objectives 
um, that our diplomats are taking to these negotiating tables to, to get them to, to work. Um, in the meantime, I think there has been a real coming together um, of retailers and caterers and farmers on some of these issues um, in the UK. And there are some really innovative models out there if we look for them here, right here in the UK that we could be building on. And hopefully the food strategy part two, which will focus more on trade. Um, you know, we really want to look at that. How do we enshrine this in the very fabric of how, of, of how we produce and, and sell and market food. And, you know, another thing that's going on in government at the moment are, are restrictions on multi-buys and promotions yeah. of junk food uh, proposals. Um, and, you know, there's a, very, there's a great risk that those proposals will get pushed to the side because, we, because companies are saying, no, we need to promote, we need to promote, we need to market. But actually a lot of value goes in that that could be being invested into back into the supply chain, back into making healthy food the accessible, affordable and appealing choice yep. um, instead of the, the, the junk food that gets the majority of advertising and marketing spend. Barbara, thank you. Uh, Professor Cardwell, uh, Mike, Mike Hansen, do, do you think we are anywhere near the Dutch diamond model in the respect of the, the, the linking up of um, um, academia, um, growers, uh, the, the government, government organisations and the consumer? Do you, Professor Cardwell, do you think we're anywhere near that? I think that the, the, the recent events have, have led to, I think, a, to use the cliche, a paradigm shift in yeah. terms of, of, of going forward and as as, as the other speakers have said, what, what we do have, uh, which, which I'm not aware of before in my lifetime, which is tolerably long, is, is, is alliances formed of where you're getting landowners with, with the NFU, with producers, and it, it does seem to be right across the board. Definitely in terms of academia, there is far more focus on food and on sustainability. And one thing I've found particularly encouraging is among the students, it's it, like, issues yeah. like climate change, food science and things are some of the most popular topics now, whereas they weren't even on the agenda t uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. Mike, your views, please. I think that um, uh, consumers, caterers, growers, farmers um, are becoming more, uh, and, and academia is becoming more and more connected. Um, I think the one, uh, the one group that are slightly out on a limb and we all scratch our heads as to what on earth they're doing is um, politicians uh, and how they will um, bridge the gap between communication and collaboration with everybody. Um, I, I agree with Professor Cardwell, the, the, particularly the, the, the current pandemic has brought a, re a renewed focus around food, food quality, food sourcing, uh, food safety. Um, obviously, we've all heard, we've all read the stories and and heard on the media around um, zoonotic transfer of, of diseases um, through food. I think people have taken the opportunity to become more connected with the food they're eating. Uh, certainly, it's, there's been some figures coming out of RAT that food waste in the home um, has reduced slightly, and that's probably largely due to people having to plan their meals a little bit more because they haven't been able to get to the supermarket or get the deliveries or whatever. So their opportunities to go shopping have, have reduced. So the fact that plan their menus and planning menu for the week means by definition that you're you're buying what you want rather than just buying anything that's that you fancy on the day because you're a bit hungry and then not eat it and throw it away. Yeah. So there is a real connection at the moment. And I think the, we've got to grab the opportunity. Um, the one thing that concerns me around the current trade deals, um, uh, food safety uh, and affordability. And I think that's the problem. Um, that the, the lower quality food uh, with lower standards will end up being cheaper. Uh, and the people who, with, with, the people who can only afford um, that food will, that, um, and then that will drive that consumption. Um, and I think that's where policy has got to come in. That's where policy has got to make change in terms of tariffs. And I know we've, you know, tariffs have been uh, mentioned a little bit earlier and we'll probably come onto it a little bit later as well, but um, that is, a, that is a massively important area to, to ensure that affordable food, um, the, that, that safe food is affordable food. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Barbara, Mike, thank you. Barbara, what's the answer to that safe, affordable food? Because presumably there's a, there's a lot of uh, food businesses out there who are driven by their, their, their shareholders and they just 
need to make as much margin as, as possible to satisfy their shareholders, pension funds, who, whoever they, they may be. Have, have we got a bit of an oxymoron here? That's it's, it's, it's fascinated by what Mike said earlier, that they're, they're driven in a completely different manner. They're not driven by the bottom line. But it, it's Mike alone um, in his business. Barbara, are there, are there more businesses that it's going to be years before they change because they, they unfortunately have to chase the dollar because of the, the way that they're, that they're structured? Um, Barbara. Are you talking this, Barbara? Yeah, 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 Barbara. I'm um, going to jump over to the other Barbara in a minute. Yeah, um, there's actually a huge amount of work going on um, in mm. relation to uh, responsible investing. Um, and so if anybody's aware of the work of share action, for yeah. example, they're doing a huge amount of work to look at indexing how uh, different manufacturers and food manufacturers are performing against sustainability, uh, food waste, um, and, and now diets and nutrition and uh, measures that will help reduce obesity. Um, and they provide that in the form of reports to investors and are getting increasing investor engagement. And I think that the investor community, um, and that includes pension funds, it includes all of our pensions probably, and they're some of the biggest investors in these companies. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a huge a growing interest around the power that they can wield in driving long-term sustainability. Because obviously, you know, uh, 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 and at the moment, I think the prediction is that a child born in 2020 is around half of the children that are going to be born this year are likely to have diet related diseases by the age of 65 wow. on the current trajectories. And wow. um, that is not a healthy environment for any investor looking to at a long term strategy yeah. for a business. Yeah. And so I think increasingly those issues, whether it's climate change or whether it's obesity and public health, I think they I think that's that's where we've got to um that's where we've got to look. So I, I would, you know, strongly recommend looking at the work of, of groups like Share Action because I think they're doing incredible work. And we're also seeing the the the, tr the, the big trusts and funds yeah. um, doing the same doing the same thing and looking at how do they leverage their power as having kind of large amounts of money and what do they do with their investment capital um, to do the same. So, so what I'm learning is that uh, although I've got a frustration that perhaps it's not moving uh, quickly enough. If you look yeah. at the likes of Mike's role, uh, Mike's role wouldn't, probably wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. Um, and you look at the likes of Legal in General on the diversity piece that Legal in General, one of the biggest pension funds in the UK, have stated to the, the main companies that they invest in that those companies, if they don't have a diversified, diversified board um, by the end of 2022, they'll be pulling the investment out of them so they're actually forcing that forcing that change so barbara barbara bray did just the, the the same question do you do you think that we are seeing a change in the respect of um food trade standards and companies perhaps not chasing the dollar and being more like backs the story and, and looking to make, make a positive difference i think we are and i noticed it maybe a couple of years ago when i started working with a client who was a b corp client so they've gone through the process of registering and it, it makes them look at the business in a different way. They're already a conscientious business, but when you're having to report on your key performance indicators and it's across people, planet and profit, you, you do look at businesses and, and see them in the round and seeing that the impact they have on society as well as on, you know, for the shareholders. And it seems like that has started to build momentum. More people are looking at that. And when you look at the international companies, they have bigger budgets than, than some governments and probably soon ours will fall under that where the companies that are, you know, are running in, in this country are going to have bigger, governments, bigger budgets than our government. So we need to be careful about, about that corporate governance and, and what the impact of the, the foot or the footprint of business is on society. And I think there, there is a shift Probably like Professor Michael Carwell said, it's coming from consumers because nobody wants yes. coffee that's been packed by somebody's small child or trainers that have come from somebody who's being born into slavery. You, you don't want that in your in your home. So why would you wish it on anybody? And I think consumers are, are who's going to drive all this action and change. And I think as different people come together within different from across different sectors, like we're talking about collaboration more and seeing where the issues are in each sector, those things will become more exposed. So if you look at the food industry where there was a huge drive on kind of ethical trade and making sure that there was no modern slavery in the supply chain, 
eventually what happened was that the clothing supply chain had a closer scrutiny. So we can learn from other industries and pass on best practice. And, and that's why I think these forums are so yes. important. Absolutely. Everyone, we're slightly running out of time. So just going to go to our um, expert panellists to, uh, to sum up uh, for us. So we're going to start with Professor Cardwell. Um, Professor Cardwell, I asked you this question um, earlier about um, what's this all going to look like um, five years from now. R rather than asking you that, what, what do you want to see? What do you want to see for food trade standards and, and the positive implications for healthy and sustainable food? Professor Carl, what do you want to see for food trade standards? What I'd like to see is totally enshrined the fact that everybody, regardless of their uh, financial well-being, is able to have access to safe and nut nutritious food. And it's, in fact, that's a, a con totally consistent at risk of going back to the law with the with things like the, um, uh, the, the, the international government on, 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 uh, that, that's in that area. And I, I just, it just seems to me as a, as a sine qua long, that's something everyone should be entitled to. And if, if, if then if there's additional quality, that's good. And you hope for that as well. But I think that's a basic everyone should have. And at risk of repeating myself, I would also would love to see in terms of the law, the World Trade Organization rules, working towards that the yeah. scope to renegotiate them to, to have new those new priorities yeah professor thank you mike your views please what what would you like to see for food trade standards um quality uh, affordable quality i think um, it's probably the same as everybody's going to say um but uh, supporting the the smaller producers the local uk farm produce that we currently buy um, and we want to continue buying. We want to support local economies, etc., in the UK. Um, and we want to make sure, or we want to see that they are not um, priced out of the market. Um, and that requires um, uh, huge policy shifts and commitment from government to make sure that happens. And Mike, do you think that can happen? Uh, I am an optimist and I'd like to think, yes, it can. And, but I do think, and as I've said this before, um, the consumer and the caterer uh, will drive this um, and they create the change that then government will adopt. Um, I think, generally speaking, um, majority, of, majority of the time, um, society drives government rather than the other way around. Yeah. And government responds to uh, what society wants. So... It's important that we make that we maintain it, that we continue to buy British produce. We support those local farmers and producers, um, and then that will create the change that we need. Um, I don't hold out a huge amount of hope, particularly with Brexit happening at the end of the month, that, um, that we're going to get an awful lot of uh, thumbs up from government at this stage. It, this isn't an avatar for, for Baxter's story, but do have a look at Mike's website and have a look at their business and follow them because they, they are fascinating. Barbara, Barbara, Barbara Crowther, what do you want to see for food trade standards? Uh, first of all, we want to see them uh, enshrined in law uh, in the right. Agriculture Bill. Uh, I think we, uh, I would echo a lot of uh, what Mike has just said. I think it's about creating opportunities, not just for large scale producers, um, I think we would like an agri-ecological approach um, to be increasingly the norm uh, in, our, in our own food standards and that farmers are rewarded uh, for their stewardship of land and natural capital um, and also for public health to be seen as a public good um, so that, you know, people can benefit from, you know, it's be, it, I think we've all become very, very acutely aware of how um, access to nature and access to open outside is is intrinsic to our mental health as well as our physical health and um, so public health is a public good um, in um, recognized um, in how we are conducting our trade deals and and really just trying to make sure that no matter how much money you have in your pocket you have this cast iron guarantee that some of the things that we have weeded out, some of the nasties, the nasty additives and colorants um, and some of the um, harmful um, pesticides, fungicides yeah. um, that we have weeded out of our system, that, that no matter what your pocket is, that you are, you are protected from food that's been grown using those methodologies in the worst 
uh, forms of animal exploitation. I think no, nobody seems to want those things anymore. So let's hope that that, that is part of our future. Barbara, thank you. So, so just coming to the, 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 the founders of this group, Barbara Bray, Jackie Green and, and, and Mark. Um, so we, we, we've got a call to action here, but let me ask the question, guys. Can consensus be achieved across food businesses, farming organisations and civil society on this issue? So I'm stealing this phrase again of the, the, the Dutch diamond. Do, do you think this is achievable? Mark, let's start with yourself. Yeah, just unmuting myself. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, consensus uh, can be uh, uh, achieved already. I think we've seen some of Britain's leading supermarkets have have pledged to avoid stocking, for example, American meat imports. Uh, you know, chlorinated chicken, hormone beef, etc. You know, if a UK US uh, post Brexit deal uh, is signed. Uh, you're seeing great um, alliances, as I say, between farming organisations. Uh, watch out this week. I think Saturday um, there'll be a thousand pumpkins carved to spell Save Our Standards laid in Parliament Square, I think organised by the uh. Land Workers Alliance. So watch out for that. Um, uh, and let's continue to put pressure uh, on the government to, to, to change its approach. Excellent. Barbara, Barbara Bray. I think it's already been said, but I am optimistic that because everybody is pledging across industry, whether it's um, retail or food service, to maintain, maintain standards, that that will be what happens. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If uh, we end up with a lot of tariffs and food becomes more expensive, will there be a temptation for people to try and go down the, the lower specification and the cheaper food route? I very much hope that we don't do that next year and that we do maintain good standards and we get those standards enshrined in law. Jackie, Jackie Green. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that um, Mike made the point around um, the consumer and caterer being the people who will make this happen is that we often hear about chlorinated chicken, we often hear about hormone uh, fed beef, but actually there are so many more examples of standards. So I would just urge anyone within the sort of food and fresh produce and farming industries to shout loud about the issues as they see them for their specific sectors because the caterer and um, the consumer are only as good as the information they're given and it risks becoming all around chlorinated chicken and all around beef and there are such a broad range as Barbara Crowther's really clearly made around uh, pesticides, fungicides food colourings, additives, there's so much more. So, yeah, I would really urge anyone in the industry who's got um, a voice to, to make sure they're lobbying their MPs um, about the, the, the problems that are very relative to their industry. And let's not let this become generic and, and kind of... Jackie, well, well done. And it harks back to my slightly aggressive question to Professor Cardwell about contacting your, your local MP. Does it make a difference? And it does. So we all need to do that. We all need to sign the petitions that we're seeing. We all need to make a change and make a change within our, within, within our own businesses for the greater good. I think this, uh, this broadcast has been fascinating. And all credit to Barbara Bray, to, to Mark, just going Jackie Green, to gain uh, the, the speakers of the likes of um, Professor Cardwell, Barbara Crowther, and, and Mike. Is that I've, I've as, as an individual, has learned so much from this. And it's as uh, Barbara Bray sort of intimated earlier, uh, that if we are talking about this, um, it might not happen overnight, but the more conversations we're having on these subjects, such as food trade standards, the, the difference that we can make through this networking is, uh, is going to be very, very significant. So I just want to thank um, um, everyone. Just uh, before we wrap up, um, I always do a bit of a, a quiz with some of my inside contacts as to who they think had the best backdrop. Um, and today it's been equal uh, pegging. Uh, Professor Cardwell and, and Mike Hanson, you you both win the, the, the best backgrounds. Uh, Bob. Barbara, Barbara Crowther, I do, do apologise that uh, you weren't in the runnings, but Barbara Crowther, she's got builders next door, so we didn't hear hear them uh, thumping a thumping a wall. We were a bit worried that Barbara was going to disappear into the into the floor. So it's it's, a, it's amazing how everyone gets on with the slight adversity of uh, everything <laughs> on going on around them, whether it be builders or, or poor internet. But congratulations, Professor Cardwell and Mike, for having the best uh, the best backdrops uh, for the uh, for the for the broadcast today. And we very much look forward to the next broadcast. We're going to be running uh, for for the team in November and watch out for further further details on that. 
everyone, thank you very much. Keep safe and keep doing what a fantastic job that, that, that you're doing within your uh, universities, practices, businesses. Um, and yeah, just reiterate it. Thank you and keep safe. Thank you, Max. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.